Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very grateful you're, for your coming in. It's such a lovely spring day, my goodness. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Liang Bing Hu. Uh, Bing uh, got his uh, bachelor's in applied physics from the University of Science and Technology of China uh, in uh, 2002 got a PhD in physics from the University of California at Los Angeles in 2007. He then was the founding scientist for Unidyme Incorporated in Sunnyvale, uh, California. So he followed a startup company uh, out of graduate school where he worked for three years. And then he has been a postdoctoral uh, scholar at the material science and engineering department in Stanford from 2009 uh, to the present. And um, before I, 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 uh, I welcome uh, Bing and, and relinquish the podium, let me just mention a couple of uh, energy-related events coming up. Uh, we will have a seminar uh, a week from yesterday, that's Thursday, not Friday, uh, by, by Carrie Pint uh, from Berkeley. And then uh, on the 26th, which is a Tuesday, we will have a seminar from uh, Guidong Wei from the University of Michigan. And on the 28th, which is a Thursday, we will have none other than the United States Secretary of Energy. Stephen Chu will be uh, at Dartmouth uh, for an event in the afternoon in Cook Auditorium that will be followed by a one-hour question and answer session as well as by a reception in the Great Hall. If you're interested in energy, um, I can't imagine missing that, but that's up to you. In any case, Bing, it's been delightful to get to know you over the last couple of days, and we're all looking forward to your talk. OK, thanks. Uh, uh... Uh, thanks, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nee, for a uh, nice introduction. Uh, this is my great pleasure to be here to uh, share my research story uh, at Stanford University in the past two years about uh, nanostructure designs for uh, a renewable energy application. So today I'm going to show you uh, different examples to kind of give you the idea of the power of the material structure design for achieving a remarkable uh, device performances. So here is uh, one uh, example of uh, uh, metal nanowires as a highly transparent and conductive films for solar cell application. So this picture shows you a paper-based uh, solar cell lighting up uh, LED devices. So before I go into uh, the details of my research at Stanford, I would like to give you a little bit of uh, overview about my research experience. So I did my uh, PhD in uh, UCLA. Uh, I work on nanoelectronics based on carbon nanotube uh, networks. So we uh, studied the, the transport properties of such a random network and applied as an active layer for thin film transistors. I also studied the, the optical electronic properties uh, of this uh, kind of a random network. And based on this study, uh, I helped my advisor study a company which is called uh, Unidime. And in Unidime, we focus on the printed electronics uh, using nanomaterial based ink. And we printed a functional uh, layers for uh, LCD devices, for flexible uh, uh, displays, and for flexible solar cells, and so on. So I've been working for a printed, uh, for Uridam for, uh, for three years, from 2006 to 2009. And after that, I uh, joined Professor E. Trace Group at Stanford University, focusing on energy devices using uh, nanostructure materials. So today, in the interest of the time, I will mainly show you my research uh, happened in the past two years at the Stanford University about uh, transparent electrode based on metal nanowires, silicon based uh, lithium ion batteries, and also paper based energy, energy storage devices. So, as you know, energy is uh, very critical for the current society, and renewable energy is going to play a very important role in solving the energy problem. And if you look at the energy landscape, you are mainly talking about three components. The first is about energy production. And after that, we would like to have efficient energy storage or transmission so that we can use the energy regardless of the time and the place. So ideally, uh, we would like to have all kinds of energy devices to meet these three uh, uh, component, the needs in these three components. 
So along this energy landscape, there are many kinds of energy storage devices, such as batteries, supercapacitors, solar cells, and so on. But from the fundamental science point of view, many times we are talking about how to manipulate the fundamental particles in the energy devices uh, efficiently. For example, this is a device structure for thin film solar cells. So basically, you have a multi-layer structure here. At the very top layer is called a transparent electrode. And this layer needs to be transparent to photons, and meanwhile, need to be conductive to electrons or the holes so that you can carry away the generated uh, current. So in this structure, we're talking about how to manipulate uh, photons and electrons uh, efficiently. And on, on the other side, this is structure for a lithium-ion battery. And again, we have this layered structure. And if we are charging this lithium-ion battery, we're talking about how to move electrons from the current collector to the negative electrode. And meanwhile, we're moving the lithium ions from the positive electrode to the separator to meet the electron in the negative electrode. So here, we're talking about how we can design some structure that allows us to manipulate electrons and ions in this kind of energy storage devices efficiently. So of course, device structure design is very important. And many times, we uh, get ideas from nature. And we're trying to uh, fabricate uh, uh, structures in nanoscale as a counterpart so that we can benefit the structure uh, in nature. So one very unique structure uh, in nature is this uh, spider web. You see here, spider is actually very smart. It's using the smallest amount of material to make the connection from one branch to the other. And if you look into the details here, you will see actually uh, this web structure is highly flexible, highly transparent. It also has very high surface to volume ratio. So today I'm going to show you the structure of design using this kind of uh, random network based on one-dimensional nanomaterials, which I call it as a nano nets. I will show you that how this kind of random network will allow us to manipulate electrons, ions, and photons effectively so that we can use this structure for different uh, uh, kinds of energy uh, device applications. I will give you three different examples. The first example is about transparent conductor based on this kind of structure for solar cell application. After that, I will show you the second example is about silicon-based nanowire nano structure for lithium-ion battery. And in the end, I will show you the combination of this kind of nano network with paper or textile for uh, 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 efficient energy storage devices. So here I showed you two examples. One is this random network uh, made of uh, silver nanowires. And this is a, a metal grid with uh, uh, electrospinning copper nano nets. And this kind of structure uh, uh, has uh, as transparent as the spider web. But meanwhile, because these are the highways for the electron transport, so this, is, this kind of uh, structure is also highly conductive as well. So transparent electrode actually are widely used in uh, many kinds of uh, uh, devices uh, for displays, for thin film solar cells, and so on. So basically, you are talking about how to get the light in and out in the optical electronic devices. And meanwhile, you need to get the electricity in and out so that you can apply the voltage or you can apply the current. So if you do a very quick literature search, you will find in the past few years, there are about 1,100 of papers uh, in, in this simple uh, topic. And here is the examples about the usage of a transparent electrode. So if you have a, a cell phone with you, the very top layer of your device is actually a transparent conductor. And it depends on the device application and also the device operation mechanism. For example, for voltage-dependent de uh, devices, such as a touch screen or nickel crystal, basically you are using this transparent electrode to apply a voltage. You don't have a current flowing. So in this kind of structure, the, uh, the shear resistance required is about 200 to 500 ohm per square. But in the other side, for thin film solar cells, you would like to have a small, uh, smaller shear resistance. Otherwise, you are going to have a power loss, which is associated with the shear resistance as well as the current density. So among many other parameters, the two most important, par uh, important parameter is one is the transparency, the other one is the shear resistance. So current technology is based on uh, in, uh, tin doped indium oxide. So this is a, a, a thin film uh, deposit on a glass substrate. 
And this material has been used uh, for many years. But meanwhile, this material has many, many problems. One is that uh, uh, indium is an a, 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 is a expensive material. And also, the process to make this kind of a structure is a vacuum-based process. So that means also high cost. And meanwhile, essentially, this material is a ceramic material. So when you bend the material, this material will break. And this is not good for flexible electronic applications. And more importantly is the performance. You see here, at 80% transparency, the shear resistance is about 10 ohm per square. So the transparency is not as high as you required for solar cell application. So of course, to get the highest uh, conductivity, we would like to come back to use metal. But metal, as you know, metal is highly conductive, but it's not transparent. So, uh, so this is uh, the, uh, the, the structure of metal sit on top of a glass substrate. As you decrease the thickness of metal, uh, you will become transparent. But meanwhile, the sheet resistance will increase dramatically because of the scattering for the electrons due to the roughness of the glass substrate. So how about we cut uh, some material from some space and put on top of the other areas? So have this kind of a metal uh, 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 grid structure. And Professor Pew, uh, Peter Pullman at Stanford University did some uh, simulation about this kind of metal-based uh, structure. You can see here from the simulation, uh, we can get 90% uh, transparency and 10 ohm per square sheet resistance, So which is perfect for, uh, for, uh, for solar cell application. So based on this calculation, uh, I started to uh, make uh, silver nanowire uh, uh, solutions using this simple uh, chemical reaction. So basically, um, uh, ethanoglycol will reduce uh, silver from silver nitrate at a temperature of 170 degrees. After some purification and the centrifuge, we get a very nice silver nanowire ink. And based on this kind of ink, we can print a transparent electrode on, um, on plastic or glass substrate. So here is the transparent uh, uh, and conductive silver nanowire uh, on top of a, a plastic substrate with performance of 20 ohm per square and 80% transparency. And if you look into the detail here, it's a random network made of silver nanowires. And of course, these silver nanowires are highly conductive to electrons. But meanwhile, you will have a junction resistance uh, between the two different wires. So this junction resistance will decrease the performance as, uh, in terms of sheet conductance. So the reason is because we have uh, a polymer coating on the surface of these uh, uh, silver nanowires. And these polymers are insulating in nature. That will cause uh, large sheet res uh, re resistance uh, for the electrical transport from one wire to the other. So in our group, we found different ways to kind of fuse the two junctions together to decrease the sheet resistance. So I will show you the work I did using uh, electrochemical and neon method to decrease the junction resistance between the two wires. So the principle is very simple. Because silver nanowire has a, a higher reduction potential than, than, gold, uh, uh, than gold. So the idea here is basically, after we fabricate a silver nanowire films on plastic substrate, we dip it into a, silver, uh, on, into a gold chloride solution. And this kind of replacement reaction will happen. So in the end, we will fuse the two junctions together through this replacement. Let's look into some details here. So I did the measurement uh, for the, uh, the transport property of two wires, as well as their junction. You can see here, the junction resistance was one gig, larger than one gig ohm before this kind of electrochemical and neon method. And after that, the junction resistance decreased dramatically. And look under the TM, uh, you can see here, we have, um, um, uh, after the electrochemical chemical uh, uh, reaction, we see there's gold actually in the, uh, inside the silver nanowires. So both these uh, two measurements confirms this electrochemical chemical uh, uh, neon method is act effective in reducing the uh, 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 resistance of the wire junctions. So as I said, this random silver nanowire uh, network functions as an efficient uh, transparent uh, conductor. But this is a perfect system uh, uh, for, uh, uh, in, in physics, it's a, it's a percolative system. So this is a map for, uh, uh, so for uh, uh, Dartmouth College to, uh, like, to Boston here. So of course, if you want to drive from one, one place to the other, you would like to stay on the freeway as, as long as possible. And if you hit into the junction, you will like to have a very smooth junction. So this is the same as an electron transport through the random mesh 
uh, made of nanowires. So this is, a, as I said, is a classical percolation system. And below certain density, which is called a critical density, you will never get any connection from one place to the other. As you increase the density, once you reach the critical density, you will reach the percolation threshold, and then you will get conduction from one place to the other. And of course, the critical density will depend on the length of the wire. So to, in to decrease the percolation threshold, you would like to in increase the length of the wire. So this is the basically the, uh, the, the reason that um, for this natural spinning uh, continuous uh, copper nanofibers. So the idea is basically where instead of using a uh, silver nanowire with certain distance, uh, with certain length, uh, I would like to use uh, continuous uh, uh, fibers made of uh, uh, copper, uh, which is much cheaper than silver as well. So I'm going to show you uh, the other example of using this kind of uh, uh, long fibers with fused junctions, which can function as an effective transparent conductor for solar cell application. So the way to fabricate this kind of continuous fiber is very simple. You just like the way you make spaghetti. Basically, we have a copper acetate uh, mixed with a polymer in a solution, and then we push uh, this solution out through a needle. And meanwhile, we're applying a large uh, electrical field between the needle and the collector. As the wire uh, shooting out from the needle, it will spin around and travel long distance and will be fully dried before it hit the, the uh, collector. So let me show you a movie to show uh, the process of uh, electrical spinning. So you can see here, this is the, the needle, and the solution uh, is injecting from this direction. The collector is on this side. So you can see here, a continuous electrical spinning fibers is coming out from the needle and got collected on this side. So let's look into a little bit more details here about the process flow. So basically, we have copper acetate in polymer with uh, a solution uh, with inorganic solution. After the initial spinning process, we get this uh, uh, continuous uh, fibers with uh, with junctions. And after that, we burn the fibers PVA away, and then we get the copper oxide. And then after that, we reduce copper oxide to copper in hydrogen atmosphere. After that, we can transfer this copper nanowires onto different substrate so that we can fabricate devices. So this is a XRD, and here it shows we have a, a oxygen content before the reduction, and this is a polycrystalline. After the reduction, we see here oxygen content reduced down almost to, uh, to zero, and this confirms the reduction indeed happened, and we get a polycrystalline uh, copper nanofibers and it's very long, and also due to this kind of high temperature process, the junctions actually are fused. So basically, this tool allows us uh, to achieve very good uh, performance in terms of conductance as well as transparency. So we can also play some tricks by align by aligning the fibers. Uh, on, in this way, we put a two a metal in the current in the collector, so the fibers were aligned on this way. So this is aligned fibers. We can switch the direction of the, the collector, and we get the, 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 the uh, uh, copper uh, nanofiber grid. So in the end, we would like to see how this kind of structure functions as a transparent conductor, which is essential for many kinds of uh, electronics as well as solar cell application. So there are two ways to measure the transparency. One is, one is called a specular transparent. So basically, you measure the, the direct transparency uh, in a very small angle distribution. The other way is to measure the transparent, the forward transparency, uh, which include all the forward light using the integrated sphere measurement. So here we see for the copper nanofiber-based nano transparent electrode with 12 ohm per square sheet resistance, we get a big difference between these two transparency. And this transparency should be that this 10% difference should be the forward uh, scattering uh, for, uh, from the, the carbon nanofibers. And this big difference is actually will be very useful for solar cell application. The reason follows. So in the real solar cell application, you have this transparent electrode. Once the light is scattered, you will have a longer uh, a travel distance in the active layer. So this means that your enhanced 
the absorption of the light inside the active layer. For, um, so that will be very beneficial for solar cell application. So this is the comparison of the difference of two transparency measurement for uh, various kinds of uh, transparent electrode for ITO and the carbon nanotube and graphene. You see here, the difference is very small. But for metal nanowire or copper nanofiber based transparent uh, electrode, the difference uh, is much bigger, which is very beneficial for solar cell application. So I did some simulation for uh, understanding the, the fundamental uh, of the scattering. So here, this is the cross section of copper nanofiber. The incident wave coming from the left side uh, is the plan wave. And we assume there are two polarization. One is the E polarization, that means the electrical field is under the direction of the fiber. The other one is the H polarization, that means the H field is under the polarization. So the black curve shows you the intensity distribution of the average of the two polarization. So you can see here, this is the forward direction. So indeed, there is a large portion of the light which is scattered off the zero direction. So in the end, we're talking about how this electrode uh, is functioning as a transparent electrode, a transparency to uh, photons and the conductance or sheet resistance to electrons. So this is the material ITO we're trying to replace or trying to compete. And this is the uh, continuous copper uh, films. And this is a copper grade from literature. And you can see here, this is the performance of our uh, uh, transparent electrode based on continuous fibers with fused junctions. And we also compare with the best transparent electrode from carbon nanotubes and as well as from graphene. So you can see here from the engine, uh, simple uh, uh, material design, we can achieve the best performance in terms of uh, uh, sheet resistance and the transparency, which is very important for next generation solar cell or display applications. So this is a quick demonstration of using this um, a transparent copper nanofiber as an effective transparent electrode uh, for plastic solar cells. So this is the device structure. We use a P3HT, P3BM as the active layer for this uh, solar cell fabrication. You can see here that the main message here is the power conversion efficiency is 3.0% is very comparable to the ITO based uh, devices. But remember the, the process as well as the materials are op optimized for ITO-based devices. So I think with the further development and optimization, we can further enhance the, the power conversion efficiency. So this is a summary for the first part. I showed you how we can engineer uh, metal uh, structures, which allows us to achieve the best transparent electrode, which is very important uh, for a solar cell application. I also show you how a printed uh, silver nanowire nanowork can also function as a, a efficient a transparent electrode. And of course, there are uh, further study uh, ongoing to really understand the stability uh, to get the best design in terms of geometry and so on. What's the size of the nanowire? The, so the silver nanowire, is uh, in, in the length is about uh, a few microns, five microns. The diameter is about uh, uh, 30, 50 uh, nanometers. Copper is about 90 uh, nanometers. And the, the length is, uh, as I said, is uh, uh, kind of up to hundreds of microns. So why should it be scattering such a much smaller than a wavelength? Why it should it scatter? Because this, uh, uh, the, if you, I mean, basically the simulation shows you that, uh, um, um, yeah, it's, it's much smaller than the, than the wavelength, but it's, we still get a certain uh, level of scattering. That's why we only get 10% scattering instead of a much large percentage of scattering. But my question is, why does it scatter? The scattering is uh, basically is the, um, uh, you know, I, as I show you in the simulation, you have uh, two polarization. And for the, especially for the E-field polarization, you get a big scattering because of the electrons will move together. So you just, you, if you solve the microwave, uh, uh, Maxwell equation using these metal nanofibers, you get the distribution of the field, and that's the contribution for the scattering. Yeah, because of this one-dimensional structure, if you use a thin film, it's going to basically uh, reflect uh, dramatically. So 
uh, I showed you how metal nanofibers can be engineered to function as an effective uh, transparent electrode for solar cell application. I would like to show you a little bit of variation about this structure, but for a totally different application for lithium ion battery. So here I'm going to show you a cold shell nanonet structure. In the center is carbon nanotubes, on the shell is silicon. And the silicon is functioning as a lithium host to store lithium ions. And, and carbon nanotubes at the core to take care of the electron transport. And because of this power structure, lithium ions can transport very effectively across the entire structure, and so that you will effectively decrease the diffusion length for the lithium transport into the silicon. So I'm going to show you how this kind of kosher structure can function very effectively as a, a, a lithium ion battery anode. So the reason why lithium ion battery is so attractive uh, to many people is because it has a very high uh, energy density per, per weight and also very high energy density per volume compared with other kind of uh, 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 battery devices. But meanwhile, the performance is not as good as we want. For example, for, uh, for this kind of uh, iPhone devices, if you are able to open this device, uh, you will see actually more than 50% of the volume or the weight is actually from the battery. And for electrical vehicles, you are talking about 8,000 of batteries, seven or 8,000 of batteries. So you are talking about a, a large quantity of the battery uh, devices. So uh, for ideal case, we would like to have uh, um, a larger energy density in terms of weight as well as, uh, as volumes. So this is a, uh, a, uh, this is a cylindrical uh, battery. If you uh, unroll the battery, it's like a jelly roll. So it looks like your belt. And uh, basically it has a, a, like a one, uh, one meter uh, in length and uh, one or two inch in diameter. So this is the structure of uh, this lithium ion battery. It has this uh, layered structure and it has an active uh, in actual, you have current collector, you have a separator, as I said in the, in the beginning. So the energy density, one of the key parameter for this kind of energy storage devices depends on the voltage difference uh, between the positive and negative electrode times the number of ions that you can store them inside the electrode, normalized by the battery weight. So that's the reason why carbon is widely used, because carbon is a very lightweight material, and it has a, a theoretical capacity of 370 milliampere hour per gram so this is the milliamp is the current. This is the time. So basically, it's the charge divided by the, the mass. But recently, um, uh, the current battery technology has achieved almost the theoretical capacity of carbon. So you cannot do too much about this material further. You almost achieve the theoretical, theoretical capacity. So to further enhance the energy density uh, for lithium ion battery, we have to use new materials. Uh, so one exciting uh, uh, material is actually silicon. So from this uh, um, reaction, you can see uh, lithium will be able to insert into a silicon from this uh, silicon alloy. And the one silicon uh, actually can take up to 4.4 uh, lithium. And from this uh, simple reaction, we can calculate the theoretical capacity for silicon is about 4,200 milliampere hour per gram, which is 10 times higher than the current negative electrode based on carbon. But associated with this uh, uh, amazing performance is a huge problem. As you put a lot of lithium into silicon, the, the silicon will tend to uh, expand in volumes. And as you put a 4.4 lithium into silicon, the volume change is about 400%. And then when you discharge the battery, you take, uh, you take the lithium away from the silicon, the, the structure will shrink back. And then during this kind of charge and discharge process, silicon structure will tend to break. So that will cause the failure of the uh, lithium ion battery devices based on this material. So even though this material is very attractive, there's a huge challenge here. So this is what happened for silicon based lithium ion battery. It was a thin film. After a few cycles, you can see here, uh, the silicon thin film uh, breaks into pieces. So this is not acceptable. For, uh, for battery application. So that's the reason why uh, in the past uh, uh, two years, uh, uh, two or three years, uh, silicon nanostructures uh, uh, has att attracted a lot of attention. 
And this is a structure for silicon nanowire based battery, and this is for silicon um, nanotube based battery. So there are two things in common for this kind of silicon based structure. One is that all these structures are based on uh, nanomaterials. So that means the stress building up in this kind of nanostructure is much smaller compared with, your, compared with the bulk silicon material. The second case is that uh, this kind of structure has a lot of opening space for the silicon to expand. So for, for example, here you have a lot of space between the silicon nanowires. So that will allow silicon to, uh, to expand in different directions. But there's a huge problem still associated with this kind of uh, uh, freestanding silicon nanostructures. Like for silicon nanowires, and after a few cycles, we still find actually silicon nanowire will tend to break because there's a nothing to support this kind of uh, long uh, one-dimensional objectives. So I will show you the design of this structure, uh, a cold shell structure. Here, um, I have a carbon nanotube uh, conductive uh, framework or mechanical uh, backbone, and overcoated uh, the carbon nanotubes is, is silicon. In this case, carbon nanotubes will function as excellent channels for electron transport. And meanwhile, carbon nanotubes is also mechanically uh, uh, stable. So they will hold the entire structure during the initiation denization process. And the meanwhile, this kind of pore structure, as I said in the beginning, you will decrease the diffusion length for the lithium in, in, into the silicon structure, so which will enhance the power uh, uh, performance for this kind of structure. So uh, based on this uh, um, concept, I fabricate a uh, carbon nanotube, uh, which I call it as a sponge. The reason is that this carbon nanotube films is highly uh, porous. I compress these um, uh, uh, silicon films, uh, and then if I release it, it will actually will come bounce back. Um, so this means this silicon, um, um, uh, this carbon nanotube sponge is highly porous. It's more than 90% of the, the volume is actually uh, 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 is a porous. So that means if I want to deposit a silicon onto the structure, I can deposit the silicon into the entire uh, carbon nanotube uh, framework. So this is very important because this will allow me to uh, have a high percentage of silicon mass per, per area. It's just, uh, as, I, as, as I was always talking that, uh, it's just like if you, if you want to uh, eat a turkey sandwich, and turkey is the meat you want. Here we're talking about uh, a silicon battery, so just like the way you want as much turkey as possible. So here, uh, silicon is the material to store the lithium. So here we would like to have enough silicon as much as possible. So that's the argument here. That's why the silicon mass per centimeter square is very important. And this kind of uh, energy pair is also very important for the MEMS device application. So a little bit details here about silicon deposit on the carbon nanotube uh, uh, sponge. You can see occasionally you have a nanotube coming out and silicon is coated on the surface. And the high resolution SEM and the TEM shows you that uh, this cold shell structure, you have carbon nanotubes and you have a silicon coated on the surface. And uh, uh, TEM told us this is actually amorphous silicon. You can see the silicon signal and the carbon signal from carbon nanotubes. So after we have this excellent uh, cold shell structure, uh, I started to make uh, uh, batteries out of uh, this structure using a uh, uh, coin cell uh, device. So basically, I have silicon carbon nanotube function as a um, negative electrode. I use lithium metal as a reference electrode. Basically, what we do is that for this two terminal device, we apply current and we measure the voltage change. And because silicon is a negative electrode, as we charge the battery, actually the voltage will decrease. And then we switch the direction of the current. So that means we start to discharge the battery, the voltage will increase. So in the battery field, people normally uh, use uh, this kind of a voltage profile. So the voltage is still the same here, but the x axis is normalized by the time of charging, the current. So this is the time, this is the current, normalized by the weight, which is called the capacity. So this kind of voltage profile is very commonly uh, seen in the battery uh, literature. So we can do this kind of uh, voltage profiles for different cycles. 
So this is the charge profile, and this is discharge profiles for different cycle numbers. From this kind of voltage profiles, actually we can get a very important information out. One is the capacity, basically the charge you can store per weight of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the electrode. So you can see here we can easily get a 2,500 milliamp hour per gram for this kind of a cold shell structure. And the other important parameter is the coulomb efficiency. It's basically the, the ratio between the number of charge you take out uh, and the number of charge you put inside the structure. You can see here the first coulomb efficiency is about, uh, uh, about 80%. So that means about 20% of the charge you put in is actually wasted. So we believe this is due to the electrolyte decomposition at the interface. As you are charging the battery for the first cycle, you decompose the electrolyte onto this silicon carbon nanotube uh, surface. This, this is the reason why we see a fluffy layer uh, on this kind of silicon nanotube surface. And after we wash away this, uh, um, uh, this layer, we see actually a silicon uh, carbon nanotube structure become highly porous. This may ex explain why there is a constant decay of the capacity. Because as, you, uh, as I said, during this kind of process, silicon will tend to break and that will decrease the capacity because some silicon is actually detached from this silicon carbon nanotube cold structure. So of course, we want to solve this problem. We get very nice structure, we get very high capacity, but we get very bad uh, cycling performances. So how to solve this problem? So um, this is a simulation study about the volume change versus the number of lithium you put inside the silicon. Of course, the volume change will be proportional to the number of lithium you put in. So how about we decrease the number of lithium we put inside the silicon so that we still get high enough capacity, but the volume change is not that high so that we can uh, get, still get a stable cycling performances. So we can do this by uh, uh, control the cutting off voltage as we charge the battery. So instead of charging down to 0.05 volts, how about we stop as we charge down to 0.17 volts? So in this case, we get capacity of 1,300 milliamp hour per gram. It's smaller compared with the previous case, but the cycling performance is, is much better. And 1,300 milliamp hour per gram is still much, much higher than the current carbon-based technology. So we see the uh, surface uh, morphology change for these different kinds of cutoff voltages. And we see there's a very good correlation between the surface morphology and the cycling performances. And together with Professor Nick's uh, group at Stanford U University, we start to uh, do some simulation to understand the um, uh, stress distribution for this kind of uh, structure. So this is the uh, uh, um, carbon nanotubes. This is the silicon coating on the surface. And so this is uh, uh, the stress distribution uh, along this line. So this is zero here. And as we uh, move away so that we see the stress uh, decrease as it's moved away. So there's a st huge stress building up at the interface uh, between nanotubes and the silicon during the lithiation process. So let's see uh, this movie here. So focus on this interface, this carbon nanotube and the silicon interface. You can see here there's a huge um, uh, stress building up at uh, this interface. And, um, and we believe that this huge stress building up at this interface could explain why uh, uh, silicon uh, start to break during this station process. So in actual chemical impedance uh, measurement is, uh, is very important to, uh, 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 for us to understand the transport of, of uh, the lithium as well as the electron uh, inside the structure. So this is the device structure. You have silicon uh, carbon nanotubes. You have the lithium metal. So, uh, so you can see here. So inside this current collector is basically a electron uh, conductance. And up in this layer is basically electron one lot transport, but the lithium ions will transport from lithium metal across the separator through this SEI layer, and then will diffuse into silicon carbon nanotube uh, 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 structure. So this is the equivalent circuit for this kind of uh, transport uh, study. You can see here, this is the component from the lithium transport across this structure. And this is the double layer related uh, 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 impedance. And this is the charge transport at the interface. So luckily, all these components will show up at different frequency. 
because for like for this part, in lithium ion can transport uh, much faster in this layer compared with uh, in the silicon carbon nanotube layer. So this impedance will show up at the high frequency. So this is the um, um, impedance uh, plot at the different frequency. So this number will correspond to the, the transport related to the electrolyte part. And the sum cycle is actually associated with the charge transport. So I will show you a, this kind of measurement, a different uh, uh, charging state as well as different discharge stage as well. So this is the measurement as we charge the battery at a different state. You can see here the semi-cycle actually, as we uh, charge it, the semi-cycle actually decreases. That means as we put more lithium into the silicon, the silicon become more lithium ion conductive. So this is the reason why we have this decrease of the semi-cycle. And as we take away, as we take away the lithium ion from the structure, the semi-cycle start to increase. So these two measurements actually are consistent. And we also measure this kind of semi-cycle at a different charging and discharge state for different cycles. We see here, after the first cycle, the semi-cycle actually uh, decrease. This is due to the uh, porous structure formation for the silicon structure. And after that, we see the semi-cycle start to increase. This is due to, most likely, due to the SCI layer built up uh, for this uh, silicon carbon nanotube structure. So summary for this part, basically I showed you how uh, we can fabricate this uh, um, uh, interesting co-shell structure. Their nanotube will take care of the electron transport and also nanotube will uh, function as a mechanical uh, framework for silicon deposition. And this co-shell structure will effectively decrease the diffusion uh, length for the lithium inside the silicon. And we get a very good uh, uh, um, uh, mass loading and also get a very good um, uh, capacity. With limiting the, uh, cycle, uh, the cycling voltage, we get a very stable uh, cycling performances as well. So now I'll move to the third part. This part is more uh, uh, relaxing. And I will show you actually a great marriage actually between uh, 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 nanomaterials uh, and paper or textile. For the, for the emerging uh, energy device applications. So here, I'm going to show you um, um, how we can take the advantage of nanomaterials in, with the diameter of uh, five nanometer, for example, for nanotubes. And we put on top of a paper or textile fibers, which has a diameter of 20 microns. Now, I'll show you how this uh, uh, hierarchy structure can function as an effective component for addressing uh, this uh, emerging energy uh, 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 applications. So paper is actually widely used. And paper uh, is actually made of cellulose, which, is com uh, which comes from, uh, from a planet, from a tree. And this is the structure of the cellulose. But if you look into the details of paper, you will see actually paper has a very interesting uh, structure. And paper is made of a big fibers with a diameter of about 20 microns. And if you zoom in to see the uh, details of uh, each paper fibers, it's made of um, many, many tiny, small uh, cellulose nanofibers. So this kind of a porous structure is excellent for us to manipulate ions inside the structure. But paper is not conductive. So even though we can manipulate ions very effectively, we cannot transport the electrons uh, easily. So the first thing we need to do is to make paper conductive. And meanwhile, actually, uh, paper electronics is becoming uh, uh, very popular. The reason is because uh, paper has this unique advantage. It's, a, it's a printable, it's low cost, and also um, um, people have uh, demonstrated all kinds of uh, energy devices or electronic devices uh, on paper substrate. And for realizing the paper-based electronics, we would like to have a paper power embedded with uh, uh, paper so that we can have uh, integrated uh, paper electronics. So with these two motivations, I started to make uh, a highly conductive paper. So when I joined Professor Yichui's group at Stanford University, I proposed this idea. And it turns out it's uh, actually become a very exciting uh, field. So the reason, uh, uh, the way we make a, a paper conductive is based on uh, carbon nanotube ink. So this is a carbon nanotube powder. And with the help of surfactant, basically we have a, we have a surfactant uh, wrap around the carbon nanotubes. 
with the help of the mechanical force, we can um, disperse nanotubes into water and get this stable uh, carbon nanotube ink with the concentration typically one milligram per milliliter. So after that, we, uh, we can uh, coat uh, carbon nanotube uh, uh, ink onto different substrate. You can see here on plastic, you have a, a high uh, contact ang uh, angle on paper. There is a very good wetting, uh, uh, which is not surprising to us. And we can write uh, this conductive ink onto paper, or we can do the ink jet printing. So we can also do this kind of myelite coating. Uh, very quickly after this uh, uh, coating process, we can turn the insulating paper into a highly conductive porous medium with the sheet resistance in a range of few ohms per square. So this um, uh, highly conductive paper is actually um, uh, very, uh, very promising for uh, energy uh, device application. So this is the structure of paper uh, uh, fibers with carbon nanotube coating on the surface. If you zoom in, you will see actually uh, the nanotubes are conformally coated on the surface of paper. And because nanotubes is a one-dimensional material, you can overcoat the paper surface so well that it can actually link all these paper fibers together. And that's why this whole paper turns into a highly conductive uh, medium. And this paper is actually, uh, after this kind of uh, overcoating, paper become uh, highly conductive, highly flexible, as well as highly porous as well. So based on this conductive paper and conductive textile, so I apply the same technique to make highly conductive textile. And we can open a whole range of applications. The goal here is basically using this uh, thin conductive paper or uh, highly porous conductive textile to replace the traditional conductors to open up a whole range of uh, uh, device applications. So uh, in the interest of the time, I'm not going to uh, show uh, all the result of for these different applications. I will focus on arctic capacitor and I will very briefly touch about uh, microbiofusials. So why people want to use arctic capacitors? You can see here from this plot, there's a, a this is a comparison between power specific power and a specific energy density for battery and arctic capacitor. Because battery is using the whole bulk material to store charge. So that's the reason why battery has much higher energy density but meanwhile, it has much lower power density. For RJ capacitor, it's using a surface to store charge. Everything can happen very fast. So that's the reason you get very high power density, but you have a limited surface area. So that's the reason the energy density is much lower than battery. But in many applications, you need the combination of both battery and supercapacitor. For example, for electrical vehicles, when you speed up, you would like to have uh, uh, RJ capacitor once you reach the speed you want, you want to use um, a battery uh, to drive the car. So high school physics told us a battery is a super, uh, is a, a capacitor is basically a two piece of uh, a metal separated uh, with certain distance. In the in between, you have solid dielectrics, and this is the capacitance, which is related to the surface area and dielectric, and also the, the, the distance. If we change the solid dielectric to electrolyte, the charge separation will be very different. You're going to have charge separation at the interface of electrolyte and the, and the metal. And basically, you have two capacitors, capacitors in series. And because of the charge separation at the interface is with distance of about one nanometer, you dramatically decrease the distance compared with the solid dielectric based capacitor that means you increase the capac capacitance dramatically. But in real application, instead of using a flat a metal, uh, typically uh, people use highly porous conductor. So that means the surface area will be enhanced dramatically. So in this way, you really maximize the capacitance. But now the problem comes, how is this surface area accessible to electrolyte, especially for RG capacitor, because everything is moving so fast the surface area, even, you have a, even though you, have, you may have a high surface area, this surface area may not be accessible. So this comes to the beauty of this um, um, conductive paper for arch capacitor. So in this case, we have porosity at two different scales. We have uh, uh, fibers with 20 micron in diameter. On top of it, we have nanotube coating with diameters of about five nanometer. 
So that means we're talking about the porosity at two different scales. And in this case, the paper is so conductive so that you can move electrons on the plane of paper. But meanwhile, lithium ions can diffuse through the paper fibers very easily before it reach the, the surface of the carbon nanotubes. So in this case, you really maximize the surface area accessible to the ions for algae capacitor. That, so this is the device structure, and this is the device uh, for paper uh, supercapacitor. Basically, with this kind of device structure, we can do all kinds of tests. But the two common tests we did is basically we apply current. We apply current, and we monitor the voltage. It's basically charging and discharge process. On the other case, is basically we switch the voltage and, and measure the current. From either of these two measurements, we can get the most important parameters, either the capacitance, energy density, the resistance of the device, and so on at a different frequency. So based on this kind of simple measurement, I, I show you here the specific capacitance of the supercapacitors with different the current density for paper-based device compared with a PET or plastic-based uh, devices. We can see here, due to the highly porous structure of conductive paper, we get much higher capacitance compared with plastic-based capacitor. This is due to the uh, porosity structure in, with different kind of, uh, 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 with, diff with porosity in different uh, scales. So in the end, we, we would like to have uh, a comparison for energy density and the power density uh, uh, with the other kind of devices. Because of uh, uh, conductive paper is much lightweight than the, than, than the metal-based uh, current collector, we can see here we save the weight because of this uh, uh, lightweight uh, uh, conductive paper. So in the end, we enhance the energy density and the power density because of this light weighting, uh, light weight uh, 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 of the conductive paper as well. So um, we also need to get stable performances for uh, if we want to use this device for long term. So this is actually surprising to us. You see here, the paper-based supercapacitor actually can last uh, for more than 40,000 cy 40, cycles. And the reason, I think, is because of uh, this, uh, um, uh, the following. I think the paper by itself, uh, if it's, everything is sealed very well, the paper itself is very stable. And carbon nanotube has very strong binding uh, with paper as well. I think all these together contribute to these stable uh, cycling performances. So one last piece of example, I think um, 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 this uh, conductive paper or textile really opened a whole range of device applications. So this is a, a very quick demonstration of using a conductive textile to function as an effective uh, uh, anode for microbiofuel cells. So basically the idea here is we grow bacteria inside conductive paper or textile. So, in, so this is the current technology um, the bacteria can only grow on the surface of the conductor. In this kind of conductive textiles, the bacteria can grow through the entire uh, uh, structure. So effectively, because of the size compatibility, we effectively increase the amount of uh, bio, uh, bacteria grow inside the textile. So this is the interface uh, between the uh, bacteria and the conductive textile surface. So this is the nanotubes, and this is the bio nanowires from the bacteria. And because of this um, size compatibility, we actually achieve um, much higher uh, power density compared with the uh, current technology, which is based on carbon cloth. So this is the summary for uh, the third part. Basically, I showed you that how we can combine uh, conductive nanonets with paper or textile fibers to fabricate highly porous conductive paper or textile, and we open a whole range of energy device applications. So, uh, so I show you with these three examples how we can engineer uh, materials with this simple one-dimensional uh, 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 mesh type of structure with earth-abundant materials such as silicon, copper, or paper or textile. And we can open a whole range of applications and achieve a remarkable device uh, performances which achieve the best transparent electrode based on uh, continuous carbon nanofibers. And I showed you um, uh, silicon carbon nanotube as an effective 
the lithium ion battery anode. Now I also show you this nanonets on paper as an effective uh, uh, conductive medium for energy devices. So I would like to thank my uh, advisors, Professor Yi Chui and Bob Hagen at Stanford University. They are really supportive to my research. And I also um, uh, acknowledge the students and the postdocs I'm working together uh, there. I really enjoy the time actually uh, with them. And it's a very productive team. Even though I only talk about my research at Stanford University, I would like to uh, thank my PhD advisor, George Gruner, and the uh, engineer and the scientist at Ulidam. Um, I've been working for uh, three years. So this is the uh, slides uh, summarizing my future research plans. So in the future, I will focus on uh, uh, nanomaterials uh, for emerging uh, energy device application. Uh, as, as I was talking yesterday, I would like to focus on um, um, uh, earth abundant material uh, as the starting uh, point using the cellulose, using carbon, uh, silicon, uh, graphene, and so on to come out with uh, rational transformative uh, structure designs based on the fundament fundamental understanding of the device operation and so on. And I would like to use uh, energy efficient process to realize these structures for the emerging uh, energy application, especially for energy storage devices. So this is the area I will uh, focus in the beginning. And, um, and in my research, I will focus on nano uh, scale understanding, basically fabricate the devices in a, uh, in a nano scale and understand them uh, using in situ TEM uh, um, um, and the different kind of microscope study to really understand how these nano materials function as a component for uh, energy devices. But meanwhile, I was also uh, uh, working together with professors here to integrate these kind of energy devices into systems so that you will have uh, um, uh, impact for the real society. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. And I will be very glad to answer your questions as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, so silicon coating, uh, we use uh, 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 CVD, a temperature of uh, 490 degree. So you, we use silicon and uh, uh, not, pro not PCVD. Uh, potentially, we could use PCVD, yeah. So what's the second question? I'm sorry. Yeah, so in all these studies, we have the mixture of semiconducting and metallic nanotubes. So it always come as a mixture. So, um, so that, will co that will decrease the, the conductivity in terms of uh, uh, in the film level. Um, and of course, we can dope the semiconducting nanotubes and so make the semiconducting nanotube uh, more conductive so that you will enhance the overall conductivity of the film. Thanks. Yeah, we, we did we as we as from the SEM image we didn't see the cracking if we limit the the, the, the volume change. <coughs> Actually, it's, it's, it's actually not 2%, it's 200%. We're talking about 400%, 200%, yeah. How does it come? So actually, as you did say, silicon, um, the silicon, uh, become highly, um, um, silicon, the silicon structure becomes highly viscous. It's not like a rigid material. It's like a kind of like a viscous flow. It's like a sort of like a liquid. So. Um, 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 as, as, you, as you can see from the uh, simulation, if you limit the number of lithium 
inserted in the silicon, the stress building up is much less than the, the previous case. So I think in the end, the, the whole material become very soft. And uh, yeah, so th that's the one study I would like to do in the future to do some nano indentation to study the mechanical property uh, as you are needed uh, the silicon or the other materials. So I think in the material, we can investigate the mechanical properties of the structure and get some uh, fun understanding of mechanical properties. Just follow, follow up on that. <coughs> the, the softness of the silicon depend upon Exactly. I think uh, as we decrease the thickness of silicon, the stress building up should be smaller, and that will also allows us to do the full capacity charge and discharge. Uh, but meanwhile, we need to remember that we need enough silicon material to get enough uh, 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 charge stored inside the electrode. As I was using the example of uh, if you like a uh, turkey sandwich, <laughs> you would like to have enough turkey, you would like to have as much as possible. So, I mean, you are right here. Yeah, if we decrease the, the thickness of silicon, the cycling performance could be improved further. Yes, 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 that's absolute. The silicon is a. Uh, I think in, in, uh, uh, in total is 50 nanometer, and carbon nanotube is, uh, is a 10 nanometer. No, 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 that's the negative electrode. So the, in the battery, is the difference between positive minus negative. So for the negative electrode, lower the better, the lower the higher the energy. You're talking about the silicon case, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the, because it's the negative electrode. Because the, the, the four cell potential will be the difference between the positive minus the negative. So that's the reason as we charge the battery in the negative, the, the potential actually decreases. Okay, so I'm relevant to some reference Yes, reference to the lithium metal, yes, yes, exactly. So, predictably, I'm interested in the cellulose part of this. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to keep the questions balanced. But, uh, Two-part question. So what did you have to do to the cellulose to make it conductive? You modify cellulose to make it go from a poor conductor to a very good conductor, am I right? Cellulose by itself is not conductive, yeah. So we have to overcoat this conductive material, such as graphene, maybe in the future, or nanotubes, or even metal deposition. Okay. So the beauty of here is uh, using nanotube is that uh, you maintain the porous structure. Because you overcoat with the porous nanotube films. So if you, for example, if you deposit a thin layer of metal, you may block the pores of the paper cellulose fibers. And, and then the follow-up question is, in, a, in the devices you envision, what type of lifetime would cellulose have to have? <clears throat> and what are the factors that you think might be most constraining? I think there's no constraint for using cellulose as a battery material. And the reason follows, because <clears throat> currently there are many major uh, battery companies that are replacing PVDF with cellulose as a binder. So that's the role of this using cellulose in the battery material. And if they can use it as a binder for the battery uh, in actual, that, that means in actual chemically it should be stable. And in terms of cycling, it should also be stable. My future research of uh, Using cellulose will basically come use uh, come with um, different structure designs. The material, I think, by itself. So that gave me the confidence because 
I think 30% of the battery company in China is replacing PVDF with cellulose as a, as a binder by itself. Binder is only 5% of the material inside the electrode. So I have full confidence of using cellulose as a, as a, a structural component for the future designs. You talked about wanting materials that are both good conductors and transparent, right? Cellulose can be made to be transparent. <coughs> yes, that's also um, one of the major thing. I think I was, I didn't get a chance yesterday to talk about the solar cell with light trapping, with basically paper solar cells with light trapping. So cellulose, as I showed you, is made of uh, fibers. Uh, and the paper is made of fibers with 20 microns in diameter. So that's the reason paper scatter the light dramatically. But in, on the other side, each paper fiber is made of uh, uh, small fibers with diameter of uh, about 10 to 20 nanometer. So now, if we can disintegrate the paper, just like the way I disintegrate nanotubes, and then have a perfect solution of cellulose in water, and then I make a paper again based on this cellulose with diameter of uh, 10 or 20 nanometers. Now in this case, the scattering for light will be dramatically uh, decreased. And then that means I could uh, get a fully transparent uh, biocompatible uh, uh, paper. And then I will make paper highly conductive by using all these nanomaterials. So that will allow us to fabricate next generation paper solar cells with efficient uh, night trapping mechanisms. And I think this is also very exciting. So in the end, I think cellulars will find a full range of uh, applications in solar cells, in energy storage, as well as for electronics as well. You, you need to keep the cellulose around, sorry, not like this, but after you, after you create the cellulose, like, is it possible to dissolve the cellulose and retain the structural you don't want to you don't want to dissolve cellulose. You want to disperse it. You want to maintain. You, you want to still have this one-dimensional structure, because that structure will help you get a scattering of the light. And that's the that's what I mean for uh, night trapping. So that because if you have a continuous uh, cellulose film, that will be like a plastic. There's no advantage in, in terms of uh, night uh, man management. So I think this is, of course, cellulose is earth abundant. 30% of the material on the, on the earth is actually, uh, on the planet is actually cellulose. So I think we're talking about uh, materials which um, you know, is fully renewable and earth abundant. Yeah. Um, what do you <clears throat> yeah, we. I think uh, I, once I try to uh, test the stability under fire, trying to burn the, the paper of the this nanotube coating, it does help to uh, the the fire resistance. And uh, nanotube is, yeah, um, yeah. I think in terms of mechanical property, it will also help the. The, the strength of uh, this. So it remains well. flexible even when doped? Yes, it's fully flexible because in the end, especially if we're talking about the cellulose based transparent paper, you cannot tell a fiber is nanotube or cellulose anymore because they are identical in size, almost in shape as well. You cannot tell they are fully entangled each other. And if you don't measure the, op, uh, the, the, the resistance, you cannot tell it's a cellulose or it's a nanotube. So if we can make a nanotube film transparent, there's no reason that we cannot make cellulose transparent. And cellulose never absorb the light. Nanotube actually absorb the light. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much. One more time. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>